all of you at uh, the library of the University of Latvia. I'm Indrid Smuznik, I'm rector of the university, and today we have a wonderful opportunity to welcome Dr. Ismail Seraldin at the university, uh, who is a well-known scholar and humanities organizer of uh, the research information, one of the founders and re-founders, probably he is not that old, of the Library of Alexandria in, in this new shape, how it is now functioning. And that's why we are extremely honored to have the opportunity uh, to have today his view on the development prospects of his wonderful library. But first of all, I would like to give the microphone to our former president of state, to Dr. Vaira Vite Freiberger, who will uh, give an introduction on the on resume of uh, Dr. Seraguddin. Respected Rector of the University of Montreal, Honorable President Sattlers, dear guests, dignitaries, professors and students, uh, we are truly privileged today uh, to have an opportunity uh, to hear one of the great intellects of our time uh, tell us about one of the great projects of our time, and that is the rebirth of the uh, Library of Alexandria uh, famed in antiquity uh, as the largest repository of human knowledge uh, at that time in the world, known as well for various catastrophes that overfell it uh, and destroyed it, much like the Castle of Riga, which we had the honor of visiting uh, this morning uh, to meet the president. And I was telling Dr. Seragildin this castle as well has been built and torn down and built again and rebuilt. And I think that hope springs eternal and anything that is torn down and is worthwhile has to be rebuilt again. Uh, Dr. Sergei Din has been at the rebuilding of the Library of Alexandria and has been at its helm for all these years and has managed uh, in a I would say in a brief time uh, to bring it to the level of a world-class institution. He will be telling you about it uh, in a moment. I'd like to say a few words about him as a person uh, because uh, it so happens that our paths have crossed uh, in so many ways, in so many settings and continents uh, that I am privileged to call Dr. Sarah Geldin not just a colleague, but also a friend. Uh, when uh, we first met, I think it was at the Tolberg Forum organized in Sweden by, by Bo Ekman, uh, we were at a, a sort of uh, think tank uh, body about s sustainability uh, in the world of tomorrow. And there uh, he was as the vice chairman of the World Bank. In other words, uh, an expert on development, on finance, on world finance and international relations. Next, I meet him in Paris, uh, sitting uh, on the jury, both of us, uh, of the Chirac Foundation, former President Chirac's Foundation, uh, which gives out every year prizes for the prevention of conflicts. And that is something of a very much humanitarian nature. And I was again impressed by Dr. Sarah Gildin's uh, deep knowledge of uh, both the world situation, the political situation, and the humanitarian needs thereof. I was then privileged to be asked uh, to sit on the board uh, the International Advisory Board of the Library of Alexandria, and this has given me an opportunity over the last years to travel to Alexandria and to see firsthand what you will be seeing on slides and hearing about uh, in a moment. Uh, we both, as well, 
uh, are co-chairs of uh, truly uh, both political and, uh, and humanitarian uh, institution, political in a sense, but non-governmental, uh, that it is concerned about democracy and good governance, uh, but also uh, commemorates the uh, great sage and poet uh, of the 12th century who had extremely advanced views and who happened to be a Muslim and born in Ganja, Nizami Ganjavi, of whom Azerbaijan uh, is very proud. Uh, I'd like to add that few persons of my acquaintance have reached the level of intellectual brilliance that I find uh, in my friend and colleague Sergei Eldin. Because many people are brilliant in one field, or in two, or in three. Um, with Ismail, one never knows. Anything that you may touch upon, he knows about it. Uh, so if ever there was a, a Renaissance man, and I mean a Renaissance man with deep knowledge of everything from Shakespeare to the theory of evolution, uh, to, the, uh, to, to banking and finance, uh, and uh, to the state of minorities, and, and to the uh, actual statutes uh, of, the, uh, of the Muslim religion, uh, you name it, uh, and Dr. Sarah Geldin will have uh, something profound to say about it. And he does have, the library has wonderful uh, lectures of his available uh, in, in electronic format. And I can very much recommend both the ones on science that he has prepared and the ones on Shakespeare, if you please, on the occasion of his 400th anniversary. So that uh, we are truly privileged, Ismail, to have you among us today. And ladies and gentlemen, I think we can look forward to an interesting presentation. So, Dr. Serial Gudin, the floor is yours, and we are ah. looking forward to a really exciting presentation. Thank, thank you, Mr. Rector. Thank you, Madam President. You do me too great an honor. Uh, I am uh, indeed very proud uh, to call you uh, my friend, and indeed uh, I hope that uh, I will be able to do justice to uh, the Library of Alexandria in this presentation. Uh, as uh, they say sometimes uh, in, uh, in airlines, fasten your seatbelts, we're about to go on a very exciting journey with uh, a lot of uh, images to bring back life. So I am intending to go through this material, say a few words about the ancient Library of Alexandria, then the new library of Alexandria, and then how we fared in the midst of the revolution in Egypt, and then where we go to the future. But the future, as you know, in our part of the world is beset by extremism and violence. So what do we do to fight extremism and violence under the guidance of our board, uh, which Madam President is an illustrious member? and then specifically reaching youth through the web. So every time you see a red slide like that, you will know that I'm getting closer to the end. So, the, so let me move with the first. The, the, really, the idea of the ancient library of Alexandria is a revolutionary idea. Uh, 2,300 years ago, it was organized as the first universal library. Greek libraries existed before, Egyptian libraries before, but the Greek libraries looked at the Greek knowledge, Egyptian libraries looked at Egyptian knowledge. The ancient library of Alexandria was the first one that had the ambition to unify the knowledge of the world, to reach out to all the cultures of the world. And it was, of course, the brainchild of originally Alexander the Great, who wanted to unify the cultures of the world under his leadership. Now, we know of him, of course, as a great conqueror, but we forget that he was Aristotle's pupil. And I don't know about you, but I've always wondered what it would be like to be personally tutored by Aristotle. <laughs> Can you imagine that? <laughs> so he was tutored by Aristotle, and then he went on to conquer the world, as we all know. And this is the extent of his empire, and it's even more remarkable when you think that they did it all on foot. So. Uh, 
he died, uh, he selected the, the, the place for Alexandria, but he never actually saw it. He died before he came back to Alexandria, and his empire was then split up, and the part that is Egypt became uh, the, the, pro the responsibility of the Ptolemies, uh, Ptolemy being his uh, satrap in, in Egypt, and Libya, and uh, the northern part all the way to, to uh, Cyprus. Now, Ptolemy, the first soter, therefore, is the one who actually built Alexandria, built the library, and the library's history is tied with that of remarkable women. Remarkable women. So the first of these was Berenike, the first wife of uh, Ptolemy, second wife of Ptolemy, who convinced him that uh, her son should be his successor. And uh, so they had built Alexandria when uh, uh, Ptolemy I died. This was a view of what was expected, the major spacious street, and they wanted to make it the intellectual capital of the world, and it would have two marvels in it. One was the firehouse, or the lighthouse, the pharos, and the other one was the library of Alexandria. Now, that's the lighthouse. We have a reasonably good description of it. The library, these are nah, images, but we don't have exact details to be able to reconstruct it. We know it had columns and beams, and in between they had racks where they would put the, the, the scrolls, but that description would fit many things. This is a celebratory coin that was made at the time of the Dotor Library being expanded, and look at that capital and remember that picture. I will come back to it in a minute. Now, the real brainwave came from this guy, Demetrius of Phaleron, who had been tyrant of Athens for 10 years. Tyrant did not have the same significance that we give it today. He was just a leader. Uh, remember, uh, Archimedes used to work for the tyrant of Syracuse and so on. It was a, a title. But anyway, he was in between jobs, so Ptolemy I got him, and he is the one who told Ptolemy, if you want Alexandria to be the greatest city in the world, marbles and gold and temples and so on are not enough. Bring the greatest minds in the world and then give them nothing to do. Now, that is a very revolutionary idea. Uh, it's what we do now. The Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton, for example, invites Albert Einstein and says, Mr. Einstein, come, do whatever you like. You want to do research, you want to lecture, you want to write, you want to study, do whatever you like, but just come here. So that's what they did. And they got a hundred of the greatest minds, and so they built a temple to the muses, which they called the Museum Museon in Greek, museum in Latin, and it was part academy, part research institute, part library, and uh, part research. And it had attached to it a botanical garden, a zoological garden, a dissection room, and a library. And the library grew and grew and grew and then built a second building and a third building, and the name of the library covered the whole complex, including all the research and teaching. Now, Berenike, having convinced Ptolemy I, he died eight years after starting the library, but it was Ptolemy II who would rule for 42 years and really make the library the institution that we all know of and talk about to this day, 2,300 years later. They had enormous numbers of scrolls from all over the world, about 700,000 that were arranged in these racks, and all the travelers said that there were two marvels, the great lighthouse, and the Brucheon, which is here, the, the, the royal district, of which this was the museum, the library here. And then they built additional facilities next to the harbor, and that one is going to have a story. And then they built a, an additional uh, uh, daughter library on the other side of town, along with the temple to Serapis, known as the Serapium, just as the museum and the Serapium. Now, this is an interesting thing. This is the gold leaf foundation of the Serapium and inscription, and the Ptolemies used to write in Greek and in hieroglyphics. Good practice, because it gave us the Rosetta Stone, which enabled us to decipher the texts of the pharaohs when we had lost contact with them much later, as we all know. Now, Serapis was the god of Alexandria, and he was the only god I know 
who was created by committee. So there were two priests from Egypt, two priests from Greece, and they were told we need a deity for Alexandria that will satisfy both communities. So they created Serapis, partly Zeus, partly Dionysus, the wine and the facilities being nice, and partly Osiris and partly Apis. And he presided over Alexandria happily for 700 years. So given the religious strife that we see in our part of the world today, I kind of yearn <laughs> for having a committee of priests able to work out a common reason for everybody. But that was his temple here, in, in here, and the daughter library was attached to his temple. Now, the story would continue all along the Ptolemies, greatness upon greatness, of which I'll say a few words, until we reach, of course, a remarkable lady that you all know, Cleopatra. But before we get to Cleopatra, let me say a few things. First of all, for librarians, my friend, uh, the national librarian, my friend, the librarian here, we uh, had the, the third librarian, Eratosthenes, turned to the greatest poet of the Hellenistic era, Kalimachos, and told him writing poetry is something you should do in your spare time, do something useful, make a catalog for the library. And uh, Kalimachos wrote the Pinakes, 120 volumes or scrolls in those days, in which for the first time universal knowledge was organized by subject, by author, and then within subject, and then alphabetically by author, which is still how we do <laughs> bibliographies to this day. So he became the father of library science. And it was there that Aristarchus of Samos said that uh, uh, the earth revolves around the sun. And to my knowledge, is the first human being to have postulated that the earth revolves around the sun, not the other way around. Regretfully, his work doesn't survive, but we have contemporaries who have written that I totally disagree with the crazy theory of Aristarchus that the earth revolves around the sun. So we know A, that he had written it, and B, that they had debates. The, the freedom of expression and debate was uh, lively in, in the ancient library. Eratosthenes uh, proved that the earth was spherical and calculated the circumference of the earth to 98 and a half percent accuracy of our modern measurements. And that was not all. Hipparchus calculated the length of the solar year, 365 days and a quarter, to within six and a half minutes. Now, if you think about the absence of instruments, I won't say what instruments they have, but the absence of instruments, these are remarkable scientific feats to be able to do that. And uh, they organized or consolidated the ancient Egyptian uh, calendar, uh, 365 days and a quarter, a leap year every fourth year to adjust. And when Julius Caesar came, he was so enamored by that calendar that he imposed it on the Roman Empire uh, in 44 to 45 BC. And he, uh, it became the basis of so-called the Julian calendar. Our most famous scholar, resident scholar, was Euclid, whose document, of course, The Elements, is probably the only scientific text that is still being taught pretty much the way it was 2,250 years later. Uh, it's one of the few masterpieces that remain. And if we could gain royalties on that work, just think how rich the library would be. He was a full-time employee of the library. Archimedes came as a visiting professor to work uh, for two and a half years. He visited. And while in Egypt, he developed to help the Egyptians uh, the Archimedean screw uh, to raise water of the Nile. And as you can see, it is still being used over 2,000 years later. The Archimedean screw is still being used to raise water of the Nile. Herophilus uh, did the basis of, of uh, functional uh, uh, physiology, including anatomy, naming the duodenum, naming other things, and saying that unlike uh, Aristotle, the brain was the controlling organ of the body, not the heart. And Maneto wrote the history of Egypt, the Aetiptiaga, and to this day, when we talk about pharaohs of the 18th dynasty and the 26th dynasty, we are using the classifications that Maneto 
did in the ancient library of Alexandria. It was there also that the Old Testament was first translated from Hebrew into Greek, and uh, the Septuagint, as it's known, was there. Then uh, St. Mark brought Christianity to Alexandria, and the early thinkers of the church, such as Clement of Alexandria and Origen, had good relations with the library and the philosophical schools in the library. Unfortunately, that was to change later on. I am so saddened when I see discussions of girls and girls' education, and I think of Malala and what happened to her, when we used to have girls' education in the ancient library in the third century BC. And this is a girl student, and I tell my young girls visiting, no, that is not a laptop that was on her <laughs> lap. That, that was a slate on which they used to write with a chalk and erase it. Now, little remains physically of all this, but it lives in our minds. And it was destroyed not in one big fire, as people imagine. Actually, it was destroyed over a long period of time. So basically, we started with the, the library being the museum here, a second library next to the harbor, and the daughter library over here, at least those three locations. Then our story picks up again with someone you all know, Julius Caesar who came, and when he came to Egypt pursuing Pompey, Cleopatra was thrown out by her brother. Uh, and uh, so she had herself smuggled in to meet the great uh, conqueror. Uh, because at that time, Rome was on the ascendant, and Egypt was in decline. Now, uh, she was a stunning young woman of about 18. But she was not particularly beautiful like Shakespeare and uh, Hollywood make her out to be. She just had a lot of charisma, and I have to defend Cleopatra as I will right now. Uh, first of all, she was Cleopatra the seventh, but nobody cares about Cleopatra one, two, three, four, five, six. So she's the Cleopatra. But uh, she had herself uh, rolled in a carpet. That part of the myth is true. And uh, it was unrolled uh, uh, in the presence of Caesar and uh, he was completely taken with her, and uh, he decided to side with her against her brother, and that was the beginning of the Alexandrian War. Caesar, being a brilliant general, what he did was he set fire to both the Roman and Egyptian fleets, sending them both to the bottom, but having taken the Roman soldiers off the boats first, so the Egyptians sank with the fleet and died, and the Romans held the land until the legions, which were two days out of town, could arrive. Now, during this big fire, the first building of the library was burned. And that's the first big fire we have of the ancient library of Alexandria. And it was the building that was next to the harbor. Now, whether we lost 40,000, 100,000, or 400,000 scrolls, nobody knows. But keep that thought. We're going to come to it in a moment. Shortly thereafter, Cleopatra, of course, continues with Caesar. They have a marvelous time. She gives him a son, uh, Caesarion. They go to Rome, and then Caesar is murdered in the Senate, as we all know. And then Mark Antony starts, friends, Romans, and countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him, etc. Cleopatra runs away with the, uh, Caesar's son back to Egypt. And uh, there's a civil war in Rome, and Octavian and uh, Antony win, and Antony takes the Eastern Empire. He becomes ruler of the Eastern Empire. And he falls madly in love with Cleopatra. Now, it's important to recognize that I said she was not very beautiful, but she was very educated. She spoke five languages. She wrote poetry. She did arithmetic which for a young princess in her time is remarkable education. Uh, and uh, she had a lot of charisma. So how come that Caesar and Antony fell madly in love with her? Well, I think it's not physical appearance because these were the masters of the world. So they could have had any slave girl they wanted from the empire. Uh, it was the charisma, the personality that they hadn't met anybody just like her. So uh, indeed, uh, uh, it's one of the most famous romances in history, of course, from, from Shakespeare to Hollywood is Antony and Cleopatra, the second man in her life. And this is Antony Hollywood version, and this is Antony real. 
This is Cleopatra Hollywood version, and this is Cleopatra real. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is Cleopatra real. All right, but I mean, no stunning beauty there. Uh, but the proof of the pudding that she was a remarkable lady, that what did Antony do to get into her good graces? He gave her the 200,000 books or scrolls that were in Pergamon library. Now, as I say, what kind of a woman is it that the way to her heart is a massive book donation? My kind of woman. <laughs> That's why I defend her. <laughs> massive book donation. But it is true that they had a fabulous love affair that we still talk about. And it is true, of course, that the war against uh, uh, Octavian and Agrippa, they lost in the Battle of Actium, a sea battle. Uh, Antony committed suicide. And then Cleopatra committed suicide rather than be taken as a prisoner back to, to Rome. And Octavian then becomes ruler of the world and becomes known as the uh, first emperor uh, as Augustus. And the Roman Empire then expands and covers the entire Mediterranean Sea to the point that the Romans would refer to it as the Mare Nostrum, our sea. Now, St. Mark brings Christianity into Alexandria around 50 AD, and uh, then they c from there, all of Africa would be, or a very large part of it would be Christianized. But, but the Romans then start persecuting the Christians in a terrible, terrible way. And uh, as a result of that, to this day, the Copts in Egypt, uh, their calendar does not start the same as, our, as, as the uh, Catholic calendar or the current era. It starts in 293, called the Year of the Martyrs. And then another remarkable lady shows up, and she is Queen Zenobia of Palmyra. I hate to say what's happening to Palmyra, as we all know, and the, the Daesh people and what they tried to do. But she actually took the whole yellow part of the map that you see here, and she came to Alexandria, and she was welcomed as a liberator. And that went on until Emperor Aurelian came back, and this is a painting of her uh, being in golden chains, as you can see, after she lost to the battle to Emperor Aurelian. Now, I don't have to tell you what emperors did when they had a rebellious province. Uh, the number of people who were just destroyed, killed, crucified, uh, uh, cut to pieces, etc., etc. But what we know that Aurelian did was that he totally destroyed the royal district of Alexandria. So he left no stone on top of the other, burnt everything to the ground, and that was in 272 AD. So the original library was destroyed. All the royal palaces and temples, all that upper quadrant that you see there, including, including the tomb of Alexander the Great, which was at the Soma. So uh, that was disappeared completely. And all that was left was a little bit of books in the daughter library in the Serapeum. And that would continue until Emperor Theodosius, uh, because after Constantine the Great embraces Christianity, they stop persecuting Christians, but it, they do not forbid all other religions. It's Emperor Theodosius who, in, in 391 AD, issues a decree to ban all religions other than Christianity in the Roman Empire. And as a result, Bishop Theophilus, whom you see here uh, standing in front of the Serapium, burns down the temple to Serapis, an alien god, uh, a pagan god, and with it, the remnants of the library. And all that remains after that is some manuscripts in the hands of the scholars until a remarkable lady, another lady, uh, my fourth remarkable woman, Hypatia of Alexandria. She was the daughter of Theon, the last recorded director of the ancient library. She was the first woman whose name is recorded in the annals of astronomy and mathematics. And uh, she was a Neoplatonist philosopher, presumed to be a great orator and very beautiful. And uh, she, however, is murdered in the worst possible way 
by Christian zealots in 415 AD. And uh, her, she's taken from her chariot, cut to pieces, the flesh scraped from the bones, they light fire to her remains, and with that is the end of the great saga of the ancient library. It's been made into a film uh, with Rachel Weisz playing the role, and that's the supposedly Theon in the Agora. But that is the closest we have a portrait of her. But scientists have rewarded her with, by naming a crater on the moon in her name. And so the story is kind of from Berenike uh, through to uh, Cleopatra to Zenobia to Hypatia. You have the history of the ancient library marked with milestones of truly remarkable women. And what we know is therefore the decline started with the first fire in 48 BC until uh, 391 to 415 AD. Now, at that time, of course, the zealotry resulted in the obscurantism that we know in the Dark Ages. That was the beginning of the Dark Ages. And the, the ancient library remained as a dream. So nothing is left of it except maybe a few things. This is the temple, the remnants of the temple of Sarapis. This is in Alexandria. This fort is built with the rubble of the great lighthouse. But what remains is underwater. And look at this capital. Doesn't it look like the one that was on the coin? It could very well be the same one for all we know. But we know that it's underwater now and it remains there. But from underwater, we retrieved the statue of Ptolemy. And I said to the, the forces in Egypt, I said, bring him home, bring him home. And we put him up in front of the new library of Alexandria as the founder of the ancient library. And then nothing changed for 1,600 years until another great lady came, Mrs. Uh, Mubarak, Suzanne Mubarak, who adopted the project of the library and uh, who made the new library competition uh, possible and young Norwegians and so on. And the new library was built pretty much where it used to be or close to it anyway, as far as we can make out. And this is what the new library looks like. But of course, the new library, for which I gave up all my international positions and returned to Egypt to uh, relaunch the Library of Alexandria with the tools of the 21st century. I was, as they say in the movies, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. I mean, the idea of doing that was too much. So what did we do? Well, the like the ancient library, it's much more than just a library. First of all, it's a landmark building. You just saw the building now. I'll just show you examples of it. It's very beautiful. It's won many awards. And uh, it has this largest sculpture in granite made by a 26-year-old Norwegian sculptress. It has letters from the alphabets of 126 languages, but no complete words. There's a beautiful plaza that relates the buildings and it's looking onwards to the sea, as you can see. And if you were to lift that, uh, that uh, cover, you would see it divided this way. And on that side, we have research institutes and administration. And on this side, of course, we have the library system. And that's our reading room, which is very, very beautiful. And the architecture is really quite stunning. We have a conference center. This is our large auditorium. We have a planetarium. And we have a statue of Prometheus bearing fire to humanity uh, on our plaza. It's a hive of activities. We hold 1,300 activities a year. It has many, many uh, institutions. So this is an average day. This is a special day, <laughs> as you can see it. So this is more like an average day. This is a special day. And we try to reach children everywhere. And uh, we have about 600,000 reader visits a year, hundreds of events, and we have special programs to teach art, dancing, singing to children. We have uh, concerts, uh, ballet, we hold uh, summer festivals, international gatherings, an annual book fair, and uh, we have multiple institutions. Uh, all of these institutions have their secretariat there. We are committed to the arts, and to the sciences. And in libraries, of course, we have a hybrid library, the main reading room, with books and computers everywhere. 
and we have all these specialized libraries. So this is for the visually impaired. This is for children 5 to 11. This is for young people 11 to 16. This is multimedia and audiovisual. This is rare books and uh, microforms and the map library and the Internet Archive. And that's Brewster Kale who invented the Internet Archive in San Francisco, and we have the only copy outside of San Francisco. That's what the Internet Archive looks like, racks and racks of computer storage uh, on hard disk. We send robots to photograph every page on every website. We did have a complete copy until 2008. From then on, uh, I just uh, have uh, copies of the Arabic internet because it's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. So it is almost impossible to do. We have over a million sites that we, we uh, track. Uh, of course, we have no money so uh, to get books. We were lucky to have big gifts from France, 500,000 books. And that makes us the fourth uh, uh, library outside of France in terms of francophone library. We had a very nice donation from the Netherlands about 430,000 books, mostly in English. They are about development from the Royal uh, Institute, Tropical Institute in the Netherlands. Not the Dutch books, but we got the 90% the, the in English about development, and the others are uh, in French and uh, German and Spanish. Plus, of course, individual gifts, like 22,000 that came from Minnesota, uh, the, the rare books like the Description de l'Egypte, and recently, we've taken over even the, the uh, uh, digital material. So we moved with, uh, with Elsevier the management of their African network from the Netherlands to Alexandria. And now we manage 150 uh, locations in Africa for them. We have four museums, the Sadat Museum, honoring our president who fought for peace, a manuscript museum, which you can see here, an antiquities museum, and a science history of science museum which is tied to the planetarium and to an exploratorium where children can get exposure to hands-on science to encourage them to think for themselves to think what if what if what if and we have special outreach to youth and we have an annual science festival where we got 20,000 visitors this last year and to me it's not just the experiments that the kids do it's their attitude they're happy Science is fun. It's not something you know that uh, is hard and you have to study. They enjoy what they're doing. We have 15 permanent exhibitions and galleries, which you can see uh, some of them here. All of them donated by the artists. And this is a folkloric art collection, which we have 10 more of these. Four galleries like this one for temporary exhibitions, including science exhibitions and, uh, and uh, literary exhibitions as well. And we have 15 research centers starting with manuscripts and uh, where we digitize and we do studies on manuscripts. Uh, we have a, a special institute for scripts and writing, different kinds of scripts. And we have a center for special studies that ties Egyptian researchers with researchers elsewhere. And uh, so it's a virtual center, but we hold huge conferences like this is BioVision, which we do every two years. And uh, then, you know, the output of that, including many Nobel laureates who come, we used to publish them, and now we do it, of course, online. Uh, we have a Center for the Documentation of Heritage, which is located in Cairo, because the Library of Alexandria has facilities all over. And where the Culturama was patented, the nine uh, screen interactive computer presentation, we patented it here in Europe as well, just to show that we were the first to do this. And we now are doing it in 3D version. We have a Center for Information Studies whose uh, acronym <coughs> was ISIS. But that was a long time ago. <laughs> we started that 15 years ago, International School of Information Science, and uh, where we do a lot of digital work, including advanced work. We have an art center that created the first classical orchestra in Alexandria and where we invite operas and other uh, performances to come. We have a center for the studies of Alexandria and the Mediterranean, and it's not just about the old Alexandria, it's also about the modern city. We do a lot of studies 
about the modern city and its problems with uh, poor housing and uh, lack of facilities, etc. And we have a center for Hellenistic studies, which is the only one that gives masters and PhD degrees jointly with the library of, uh, with the uh, uh, University of Alexandria, because that, of course, is the period dealing with the ancient library. And we have a center for development studies where we talked about reform but where, of course, we are also studying the impact of the developing thinking, including the sustainable development goals and their impact on Egypt. We have a center on democracy and social peace, which we are working with the uh, Swedish-based VDEM, among others. But Egypt, of course, uh, from 2011 gave us a massive demonstration of people power, uh, twice in, in, in five years. And uh, therefore, the point that we are making are about human rights participation and transparency. And this is the, the work with VDEM based in, in uh, Sweden. And it's a chance really to mobilize Egypt's intellectuals on these kinds of issues. We have a center for environmental studies and a center for Arabic computational linguistics, which is very, very advanced work which we do in this area. And we have a center for Islamic studies where we present a different vision of Islam, including reissuing the classics of Islamic thought in the last two centuries, but Islamic humanist thought, the very progressive kind that regretfully uh, you don't hear much about in the media and the press. Uh, we, have, uh, we are reissuing about 150 volumes. We finished about 50 volumes right now that are out with new introductions, critical editions, etc. We have a center for Coptic studies, where not only do we hold conferences, but we organize courses in the Coptic language, the ancient Coptic language, which is the direct descendant of the ancient Egyptian language, Pharaonic language. It is, in fact, uh, from Demotic, which is the middle one in the Rosetta Stone. Uh, Coptic is Demotic written with Greek letters and seven letters from the Demotic alphabet. That becomes ancient Coptic, which is still used in the liturgy of the Coptic church in, in Egypt, much as, say, the mass in Catholic church was given in Latin. We have a center for Francophone activities, being the fourth largest Francophone library in the world outside of France. And we have many, many events that involve everything from science to literature to the humanities. So these are a bit of the kinds of things we're doing. But we have special programs that are done for science and for outreach. And uh, there's a special program on, on uh, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's uh, the problem with the heart that hits children. And uh, Sir Magdi Yaqub in London is supervising that and uh, doing DNA analysis. So basically, we have Oxford, Imperial College, and Florence here in Europe. And we have Cairo University and Alexandria University. And there's a lab in the Library of Alexandria that acts as a hub for the interaction between them. Then we have a lot of analytical work that is done, both in the computer side and it just comes to be presented. So we hold annual meetings on biorobotics. And this little guy sitting in my lap, called Now, he was, I knew him when he was just a baby. Then he became famous and goes on the cover of magazines with supermodels and so on, and uh, leaves us behind. But uh, robotics we've done, virtual reality we've done. We had our supercomputer. We started supercomputing over six, six years ago. And we have a new version of our supercomputer, which has been upgraded to, 10, to 100 teraflops. Now, what's a FLOP? Well, it's an acronym for floating point operations per second. And what does teraflops mean? It means that our computer does 100 billion billion calculations per second. That's, that qualifies it as a supercomputer as opposed to just a big computer. And we work with CERN and with uh, Many, about 40 percent of our work is with the European scientists. So as far as we're concerned at the library, the digital future is there, and we're the forefront of our ICT work nationally and internationally to bring all information to all people at all times. So for example, we are partners in launching the Encyclopedia of Life. Well, who are th this is a, a huge effort that tries to make sure that we have a, a single page for every organism from bacteria to whales. Uh, and elephants. 
And the partners here are the Smithsonian and the MBL of the National Academy of Sciences, the Harvard uh, uh, Museum, Conabio, ourselves, and Australia. So we are six partners that are bringing this to the world. And we've done the BA African Networks. Uh, we have now uh, 500,000 distribution, and we get one and a half million hits on this, even though we started only last April, this one. And uh, above all, however, which is more relevant to what we're concerned about, we are committed to defend fundamental values. And defending values means using the podium to defend freedom of expression, human rights, especially in these times. And I'm very proud that our friends from Norway uh, have created this project, the Beacon for Freedom of Expression, dedicated to the New Library of Alexandria, emphasis New Library of Alexandria. And we're committed to outreach. So we get university students, we take them in, in, in explorations for the poorer districts around Alexandria. And uh, we have a bookmobile which send out to the small uh, children in the schools. And we have programs for children and a massive expansion of our science clubs. We have 350 science clubs in 350 schools in Alexandria and science fairs, which you saw sometime before, science competitions. And we have our own studio which is here and where I produced also the science uh, series that uh, President uh, Bayer Avik Freiberger mentioned a little while ago. And uh, we started this immediately upon the, the start of the library. We opened in October 2002. By March 2004, 18 months later, we produced the first Alexandria Declaration calling for reform in the Arab world. And uh, we had conferences every year including youth conferences. There's about 600 delegates in 2010. And people used to complain to me, we come and talk and nothing happens. We come and talk and nothing happens. Well, of course, from 2011 onwards, nobody was complaining about nothing happening in our part of the world. But this is audience participation and voting on issues. So that's the new library. It's all the parts are essential. They reinforce each other. The whole is more than the sum of the parts. And it enables me to say, along with Bochus, that I have always imagined that paradise will be some kind of a library. But 2011, as you know, the revolution came. In Egypt, as well as Tunisia, this is the famous Tahrir Square. This is Tahrir Square during revolution at night. And basically, it was a popular rejection of Mubarak and his son Gamal. And uh, what happened to the BA? Well, first and foremost, it's important, although all the imagery was about Cairo, to remember that in Alexandria too, we had huge people power. And as you can see, this is the library. That's the university campus here. And these two red lines are where the, the demonstrations would go, the two major streets where demonstrations would go. <laughs> So you can imagine me standing there, the library has no doors, no gates, and watching that crowd coming there and waiting to see how I'm going to explain to them what we do here. But out of the crowd, these young people came out and, and, and held hands, and they're holding a sign against Mr. Mubarak, but they said, this is the library, nobody touches the library. And they protected it. And uh, just by virtue of protecting it, they didn't have any weapons, there was papers, the crowd obeyed them, and the crowd, as you can see, th there's no wall, just steps that lead onto the plaza of the library. And this is during prayer time, and in front of the library, look how orderly people were in front of the library. However, 10 blocks away, this is what they did to government house, which was protected by police and <laughs> soldiers and other things, it was burned to the ground, as was the police station, as was the the headquarters of the party. Uh, now, then they made this huge flag and they wrapped it around the library, as you can see. Uh, that's the corniche where the demonstrations were, and these are the steps. So they just put these here, and uh, this is my colleagues and I waving to passing demonstrations. 
because people protected the library. This is on the other side of the university campus. Again, you will notice that the library has no walls. There's no walls here, no walls, no gates. And uh, the people here are holding hands. As you can see them down here, they're holding hands. And uh, that's the size of demonstrations on these streets as well. Pretty soon, our steps became a meeting place for those who were concerned with human rights. As the Islamist wave began to emerge, Christians and liberals would come to the library and demonstrate to demand human rights. And as you can see here, the, the, uh, the crescent and the cross together. And this one, you can see the size of the cross being held up at the library. And this is where people would come and say, this is the place to defend the human rights. And so to me, eight years of hard work are exemplified by the, the difference between these two pictures, what happened to Government House and what happened to the library. This one is even nicer. This was a graffiti wall painted on Eastern Alexandria where it says, uh, we the youth of the 25th of January. This is dedicated to those who died in the revolution. And there are the three pyramids and the fourth pyramid is the library, and coming out of the library is a church and a mosque together. So I said, the kids really got the message. They really understood what the library was talking about, that what we stand for are these values of ecumenism, openness, and collective uh, uh, human concerns, and inspired some American ladies who made this little book about hands around the library. This is supposed to be me here. But anyway, <laughs> it's a children's book. Now, uh, it, uh, this whole story really even influenced CNN. And us now your staff coming back to work. And this is Nick yes, Robertson. Pretty much, pretty much. You must feel quite Nick, all of this was literally at the mercy of the crowd. If, if people were really unhappy with the library, nobody could have stopped them. Alexandria's famous library, saved from protesters. This is the oldest existing machine that I could find, which is 1825. We have a manuscript museum. I have, I have 19 museums and galleries. We have, for example, a copy of the Internet Archive. We have a lot of artwork that's all donated. This is also, incidentally, is uh, uh, print-on-demand machinery. The first official journal of Egypt, 1828. Centuries of artifacts and literature. More than a quarter million tourists a year. How many books in the library? Uh, now we have 1.3 million. Dr. Ismail Sarah Geldin has been standing guard over it all. When the police stations were being burnt down, where were you? You were in the library. I am here every day. So when you, when all you, of that could have happened, could have happened at the library. Went down the Academy of Science in Cairo, and uh, even the library had some small problems, but the small problems never really resulted in anybody getting hurt because we believe in non-violence and we believe in dialogue. And uh, we were able to convince everybody and things returned to normal uh, fairly quickly, and Prometheus is still standing proudly in front of the library. But now, what about the politics of the country? Well, after an 18-month transition, which was ruled by the military, the Muslim Brothers came to power, and Mr. Morsi became the first elected president in 2012. Well, Madam President is right here. Uh, the president recognized his duty to chair the board. He's technically, by our uh, law, uh, the chair of the board of the Library of Alexandria. And uh, he met with the board in 2012, and this is the meeting with the board. But he, other things unrelated to the library, he alienated everybody and new problems exploded in Egypt. And people power came out again into the streets, especially the women who were very, very upset about the program that was being pushed by the Muslim Brotherhood, rolling back gains that had been made by women including everything from marriage age to consent of the uh, husband and father about travel, etc., etc. And pretty soon, the same attitude that was against Mubarak was mobilized against Morsi. But the BA itself, the library, was not targeted. And we continued our work. So as we look 
to the future, I believe we can say that now we are a truly a national institution. So this was the inauguration in 2002, and you can see Mr. Mubarak and Mrs. Mubarak in the middle here. That's Mr. Chirac, that's the Greek president here. This is Queen Rania here, etc. And then this is Mr. Morsi in 2013. This is Mr. Adli Mansour in 2014, the interim president. This is Mr. Sisi in 2015 and Mr. Sisi in 2016. So we have proven that regardless of who sits in the presidential chair, the library is an autonomous, independent, academic national institution that is independent of the politics. The people understood it when they defended the library while tearing down uh, the other buildings of the Mubarak era, and the different presidents also recognized that. So we remain true to our mission of culture and peace and our commitment to uh, uh, the values that we have defended all along. Now what happens tomorrow, I don't know, but I do know that we have taken on a new battle. I'm optimistic. I think things will get better in three to five years, but I don't know. I work with the Sheikh al-Azhar and with the Pope, our Pope, the, Co the Coptic Pope in Egypt. And we promote a culture of pluralism where different ideas must exist and where I'm guided by this very beautiful quotation from Camus, don't walk behind me, I may not lead, don't walk in front of me, I may not follow, just walk beside me and be my friend. And I think that really speaks to a lot of what we mean when we talk about pluralism. For I believe in the power of ideas and I will marshal the most powerful expert witness, whom you all recognize, Napoleon Bonaparte. And uh, at the end of his life, this is what he said. Do you know what astonished me most in the world? The inability of force to create anything. Of course, he should know. I mean, he used more force than practically anybody. But in the long run, the sword is always beaten, well, by the pen, by the mind, l'esprit. Uh, à la longue, this will always be so. Uh, yes, indeed, all his victories and his losses militarily were very ephemeral, but his contribution to the Code Napoléon, his contribution to the Bank of France, the Constitutional Council, the, the Administrative Council of France, the Grands École, the unification of the education system, all of that stayed. So, on our watch, right now, Daesh has come around. So we have held many events, but that's not enough. When we look around us, this is the situation. Egypt is stable, but everywhere else we have ongoing wars of various ferocities being pushed by people who have a very unique, uh, uniquely retrograde uh, perception of what it means to be Muslim, very, very un-Muslim. So we're engaged in a battle of ideas against extremism and violence. And we started in January 2015 with a big conference. I spoke to both President Adli Mansour and President Sisi, and they supported that. Uh, I said, you know, military action against uh, Daesh or ISIS, as you call it, uh, is needed. Uh, security actions are needed against terrorism. But in the end, you must have ideas. Ideas will not be defeated except by other ideas. Uh, Hugo said, no army can defeat an idea whose time has come, and I think that's true. So we launched this effort, that's a big conference, where we had debates, we had breakout sessions, very, very good attendance, as you can see. I also went to lecture at Al-Azhar, this is the audience that you can see down there, all the imams listening to me. And uh, with my good friend, uh, Dr. Ali Goma, the former mufti, uh, we did a lot of work to try to change the religious discourse. Uh, these are events which we organized in Alexandria, and this is him in the lecture, and I'm in the audience there. Now, uh, we're changing the religious discourse one small bit at a time, but I have to say that he just escaped an assassination attempt uh, last month. So, uh, I told him, we must be having a good effect. <laughs> If the extremists are now going to, to uh, be concerned about what we do and come after you, it's a compliment to you. So anyway, he survived, thank God, and we continue to work together on this task, and we're also working with the Christian side. But can we reach the Arab youth throughout the rest in Egypt and the rest of the world?
that's the key question, can we reach them? I mean, it's a good thing to have scholars and conferences and talk about it, but can we? And the answer is yes. Our events are very well attended. This is uh, a Western event. That's Peter and the Wolf. This orchestra held it, and it held it in Cairo, and this was regretfully the audience that would come. Uh, the same orchestra, well, the same thing, this is in Alexandria. As you can see, they're very, very different. Uh, we did the touring program, so this was for young uh, people entering university, finishing high school, entering university, and our auditorium was filled, 17, look, even all the seats up near the ceiling are filled, but that's not all. This is 1,700 inside, and we had others listening, but outside, we had 2,000 who could not get in. And we sent our people on tour to hold, this is in Cairo University and elsewhere. This is Damanhur, Shibinikom, Tanta. We went to all of these places. Uh, so we can reach youth of the country and beyond. And then we're creating right now, uh, uh, with strong support of President Baira and our board, we're creating what we call embassies of knowledge in each university campus. And we, have these, we had these six last year and we're now building towards having 30 locations from Aswan, to ev so everywhere there is a place for the Library of Alexandria on campus that people can reach. And we go on to the whole Arab world by organizing special events, not just at the library where we bring the scholars from all over the world, but when we send them back, we, we organize events with them in their home countries. We did. We just did one in Tunisia, we did one in Morocco, we're doing one in Jordan, and then we expand the network of people in their locations as well. But above all, we are extremely good at reaching people through the internet. Well, you know, we have the ICT work is exceptional, and uh, our websites uh, were initially quite good, but then they started having problems. And uh, so we did analysis to know why. We had about a million hits a day. And uh, even with a huge drop in 2012, uh, we still had over 16 to 18 million visitors. But there was a drop, as you can see here, and we were very concerned. So we diagnosed it. Why did this happen? And it turns out there are two reasons. One, we redesigned our appearance. So I like this. I mean, myself, you know, there's a nice text to read. and. The, teensy weensy little picture here, but young people don't like that, so it now looks like this. Big picture, teensy weensy little text, <laughs> but hey, I'm not the audience. <laughs> I'm not the primary audience, so I, I like to read, but that's not the, the case. That's what they like, so uh, we went a huge increase to over a million hits a day, so as you can see beginning, that was the first step. But the second step was this, to redesign it for the, 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 uh, uh, for the, the handheld devices. Because the websites were originally designed for being read on computers, but the future is all about handheld devices. So we converted all our websites to fit the needs of handheld devices, and we had a really dramatic success. So in 2014-15, we had more than 425 million hits, which is more than a million hits a day. 15 to 16, we had more than 2 million hits a day. And it's over 817 million hits. So we expect to reach a billion hits and more this year uh, on our websites. So uh, now what's more important is this, is where the hits came from. So this was in 14 to 15, the red is Egypt, 45%. And in 15 to 16, uh, the big expansion, a large part of it came from Egypt itself. So we are really targeting the young people who uh, use computers, who are partially educated, and uh, uh, they're young because the older people don't go on, f uh, on the websites. So we're just launching our African and Arab networks. And we expect that this is going to considerably increase next year, as you can see here. And uh, that's also part of spreading the message to counter the message of the extremists, so that the values that we defend, 
uh, will make our contribution and we continue to make it. So for me, I say to my colleagues, uh, you should dare to dream and dare to be bold and yes, we will take on uh, the extremists. Uh, there are others who will fight them militarily. There are others who will fight them uh, in terms of security arrangements, but we should take them on in terms of ideas and what it means to be a Muslim with the tradition of openness and tolerance that comes from that great tradition and also how to believe in science and ecumenism and openness and that great image that the young people put with the church and the mosque coming out together of the library. So we are proud to join the artisans of a better future. These young people who protected the library because for me, they represent what Henley said a century ago, it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sadaldin, for this uh, wonderful presentation. I wonder if you would be, if you would uh, agree to answer some questions if uh, they will come from the audience. Yes, please. Yes, so, are there any questions, please? Uh, yeah. Thank you for the great presentation. And uh, may you please give your permission to uh, to allow to demonstrate this to students of, course. of the Faculty of Medicine? Of okay. Medicine, yes, yeah. of course, with pleasure. <laughs> with pleasure. Thank you very much. I think uh, I've given a copy of this presentation to the organizers. There is other Ismail in Sikkim and Heliopolis activities. Do you support them? Yes, we are very good friends. The Abu Laish uh, family uh, yes. are old friends of the library and personal friends as well. Uh, both uh, Brahim Abu Laish and, uh, and his son, Helmi Abu Laish, are frequent, uh, uh, frequently we work. But of course, they have their own projects and we have our own and uh, we need to multiply many more projects like that all over Egypt. So. Any hopes for for world model? Well, our world model is too strong a word. Uh, I believe every place needs to maintain the core values, but find the best expression that suits that location. Uh, you know, for seven years I was the the head of international agricultural research, and you can't take plants that are done in Minnesota and uh, plant them in, in, uh, in uh, Kenya, uh, you have to uh, do uh, local adaptation uh, with local varieties. So I think that Sekem and others uh, stand for values. In our own work, we stand for values that are shared, the universal human values. But how it's expressed in Jordan, in Tunisia, in, uh, in uh, southern Egypt, etc., I think in every location there will be people who will take it up from there and whom we can work with and assist. But in the end, they will have to come up with their own particular formula as long as we retain the same values. Uh, the, last, the last thing is discutable because sustainability and modernization, industrial agriculture, they are incompatible. Well, agriculture is another debate which we can discuss uh, in what we can do. There's a lot of, I mean, science-based agriculture will be needed in many parts of the world, partly because we need to promote at a much faster rate traits uh, that are not of interest to the big industrial firms, but which are of primary interest to, say, smallholder farmers in Africa. Uh, for example, uh, we need uh, more drought tolerance, more salt tolerance. We need shorter growing seasons, uh, etc. Uh, particular parts of soils. We need to convert uh, uh, the nitrogen fixation capacity of legumes and put them in cereals. And now it may be possible to do that by working with uh, gene editing techniques, which don't bring external genes in, 
but simply work with the plant just as you do in breeding but done much faster because of the science and the targeting that can be done. But I think that's another debate, another discussion, uh, although it's a very important one for food security and for poverty reduction to ensure that there is adequate food production in the poorest countries of the world. Thank you very much. And I believe we've seen the scope of your knowledge and uh, the, as uh, this is Freiberg, I said, your, your capability to answer questions in any field <laughs> of uh, the knowledge and science and uh, economy we are facing in our current world. I have another question. I, I was authorized by our university senate to ask for your consent to, um, to propose your candidacy for the honorary doctorate of our university. Would you agree that we start the procedure on... Uh, I would be very deeply honored uh, <laughs> if your university would bestow such an honor on me. And uh, I'm also a great admirer of uh, Latvia and what you've been doing here. And uh, um, above and beyond everything else, I was so moved uh, yesterday with all the children with their bouquets of flowers. And I was told this is knowledge day. And uh, all the children bring uh, uh, flowers to their teachers all, all over Latvia. And then uh, the director of the library showed me how every three years or five years you get together and you have magnificent singing and so on. And uh, I said, well, I think you have succeeded in doing so much that a gesture from you towards me is not only uh, a great honor to me, but it would also be a great incentive for me and my colleagues uh, to redouble our efforts in doing what we try to do. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your consent, and uh, this gives our also uh, the opportunity to welcome you the next year again in Riga, because we have the university's anniversary at the uh, end of September, and uh, the doctorates are then awarded during the ceremony then in one year, and we shall be extremely pleased to have you here again. Thank I you look forward much. to the honor. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. and. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I would like uh, to uh, thank uh, Mrs. Freiberg for the initiative to bring you here, <laughs> and that's oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> that <is my laughs> yes, and <laughs> and uh, and also thank you very much. It was really amazing to have in one hour such a trip over centuries or topics and at the same time uh, in the sense of true, true humanity and democracy which you are supporting in your wonderful work. Thank you very much for visiting us here.